Hey, everybody, and welcome to Healthy Living. My guest today is Dr. Vera Tarman. She is the medical director of Renaissance, which is one of the largest drug and alcohol treatment centers in Canada, where she also treats food addictions. I consider her one of the leading experts on food addiction, and she's also the author of a wonderful book called Food Junkies. Welcome, Dr. Tarman. It's so great to talk to you again. I really learned so much from you. Uh, hi, Chef AJ. I'm always delighted to uh, be here. And yes, here is my book, Food Junkies. <laughs> it's such a great book because I think looking at you now, slender, people don't realize you actually are or were a food addict and you actually were obese. It's hard to believe looking at you now. Um, yes, and it's, it's, it's hard, but I remember it very, very well, and I don't want to go there again. And uh, luckily, uh, th you know, I, I think that a lot of us who are on the, on the road teaching this message are compelled because of our own private stories. And I certainly have my own story of, of having been over 100 pounds um, and being off of, uh, like, it, not it coming back for about 10 years. Yeah, so anyway, and a lot of us are in that situation. Well, I love that you tell your personal story in the book. I, I've always wondered, because I've interviewed you so many times, that we've never actually talked about what do you do at Renaissance? It's in Canada, so probably most of the people in the United States would never be able to come, but what do you do in a food addiction treatment center? Okay, so Renaissance is a, a basically a drug and alcohol <laughs> treatment center, um, and I'm the medical director for that. So, so I would say 80% of my work or 85% of my work is overseeing general addiction care. Um, in a residential setting. But we, uh, a few years ago, got um, a donation, a large donation to open up a food addiction part of that program. And so we built into the program that we have um, a food addiction piece. And this was um, really quite um, a new experience, unusual, because most of the time when people go into residential care for disordered eating, they're going in because they have what's called an eating disorder. But you couldn't get in just by food addiction in, into a food addiction program, uh, pardon me, an addiction program, because it's not acknowledged as a diagnosis. Um, but what we did because of this donation, so we weren't held by the Ministry of Health or any funding body to, um, that was only willing to pay for addiction per se, we were able to do our own um, piece, carve out a piece of our program and, and uh, as focus only on people who identified as food addicts. And in that first year, we got something like uh, 80 people signing up. So it gave us a really nice idea of, um, of how food addiction plays itself out uh, alongside with other addicts and how similar the pattern of behavior was and uh, where there were differences. And, and what we did in uh, the food thing is we, we um, decided, well, we have to, first of all, offer a food abstinent plan because just like the people who are coming in had to be absent from alcohol or cocaine or whatever, um, these people uh, that came in had to be abstinent of trigger foods. So what we identified was um, uh, what we thought was the most, um, the biggest umbrella of addiction foods that were out there. Um, and we kind of made the assumption that if a person was coming in and giving up four weeks of their life in a residential setting, sharing you know a room with somebody else, all that stuff, they had to be pretty extreme. It wouldn't be like just I want to lose a little bit of weight. And we actually we actually weeded those people out because it was not about weight loss; it was about stopping the obsession. And we figured that we were going to um, uh, open the umbrella of addiction, addictive foods as far as possible, saying to people you may not need to be um, abstinent from all of these when you leave, but we're going to start with this. And then when you leave under the care of a, not yourself, but a, a, either a food sponsor or a dietitian or somebody who knows about food addiction, you may be able to reintroduce some of the foods. So we um, said for sure, no sugar because sugar is, I mean, we're, we're seeing the science just supporting over and over how addictive it is. Um, and our, our contention was, eat enough addictive foods and you can actually develop a food addiction syndrome, its own momentum, its own little animal, addictive, addictive uh, impulse in the brain. Um, so sugar, we figured that flour was uh, um, because it's processed, it's, it's basically refined carbohydrates to the point where it's almost sugar. We threw that in the basket. And then we discovered that uh, because most of the people we were 
attracting were women postmenopausal. That's certainly not the whole picture of who food addicts are, but these were the people that were actually seeking treatment. They'd already been on multiple diets, they'd already had surgery in many cases, and they were like pretty extreme and often women postmenopausal. And we found that uh, we often had to knock off the grains. Uh, so, so it ended up being no sugar, no flour, no grains with the idea that um, you might be able to reintroduce that. Knowing, by the way, Chef AJ, that um, there are food addiction plans out there that are valid and worthy that do include grains. We decided, though, that we were going to exclude that and leave that later. For, just like we were going to exclude dairy, we were going to exclude sweeteners, but we know that some people can eat those things. Um, but we were not going to do that. Um, so that we could get people clean, 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 squeaky clean, get this quell, stop the obsession, uh, and then start to work on uh, delivering the tools of addiction. So that's basically what we did. Get, offer an abstinent food plan, of, of which I've just described, and then start teaching the multiple tools uh, to stay clean once you leave the program four weeks later. That's incredible. So they all come together and they all stay the same four weeks or is yes. it a stop, stop and start at a different times? It, 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 it was in that uh, period of time when it was um, a donation. Then we did, it was people just came in because there were enough people coming in. As long as there were at least two or three at a time, in and amongst all the other people, the, the cocaine addicts and alcoholics, etc., they would all, we would all be sitting at the same table more or less. Um, as long as there were enough, like two or three or four it could be continuous. Now, um, because the donation is dried up, it's no longer there, um, we uh, uh, um, have to charge people, and so there's far fewer numbers, and now we do try to cluster them to two or three or four at a time. That's an incredible investment of one's life. They must be, like you say, very extreme in their food addiction to give yeah. up for weeks yeah. and, and pay a lot of money to be in it. And I can't imagine, what, what do they do all day? Uh, in the program? Yeah. Um, well, it's the same as, it, I, I mean, believe it or not, uh, one of the two most important things that we offer, because we have a five day as well, and the five days in outpatient, and it allows you to get the theory of all this stuff, but the, the month in there, you're actually living it. And, and believe it or not, it, the same as the uh, alcoholic, cocaine addict, whatever, if you're in an environment where you're virtually tied down, I mean, you're not really tied down, but you, you know, whenever you walk out and come in, people are looking in your purse, make sure you're not bringing anything in. They're making sure you're staying sober for a month. That's a big deal. A lot of people cannot do that. And with addiction, um, it's the first two or three weeks that you got to get through. And then when you're through it, I mean, you know, you and I, we're not suffering. We're not, we're not white knuckling not being able to eat sugar. It's, it's actually very easy now, but it wasn't initially. So, so that being um, in an environment where you can't and you get through that, that's a big deal. And plus you're being told uh, what foods are, are easy to eat and stuff. So what are you doing all day? It almost doesn't matter. It's the time. But what we're doing all day is, is we're in group and we're doing um, the rest of it. What are the tools that I need to learn? Like you and I were talking just before this podcast, the family. You know, the, how do you talk to a family who says, it's your birthday, come on, what's, or you've lost all this weight, now you can eat this food. You know, you can't eat this food anymore and you have to have tools, diplomatic tools, um, to um, keep yourself safe. And th th it's, you can read them on a list, but... What we learn in the program through continuous, um, it's not really repetition, but working through examples, watching other people in group. Okay, that's how I'm going to do this. This is how I'm going to deal with the fact that I can no longer hang out with you because you won't let go of uh, these toxic things. And I'm going to have to stop seeing, like all those kinds of things. That, that sounds very valuable, like, because I, I find that like, People understand drug and alcohol addiction, whether they are drinkers or drug users, but with yeah. food, they, they, there seems to either be a lack of awareness or an insensitivity. So for example, yeah. if you knew a friend or a colleague or a loved one was an alcoholic, you would probably respect that and not 
like tempt them with alcohol and say, but please, I made this margarita just for you. Why can't you have a sip? But when yeah. it comes to food, it's so uh, people either think we're crazy or being difficult and, and, and they don't, they don't understand it. Like I get a lot of clients that are females and their husbands say, well, I'm not going to keep a house without the treats I want. You, you need some willpower and self-control. Yeah. You need to push yourself away from a table, but you yeah. would never say to an alcoholic, you know, you need to push yourself away oh. from a bar. You would say to the alcoholic, you need to not go into the bar. Exactly. Yeah. And that's almost like the difference of recognizing that foods are addictive versus you can actually have an addiction syndrome now so that means that even when there's no going back like you might have been you know the person that you live with might be able to stop at you know at one bag of chips but if you if you've gone to that point where you're used to the box you know the box of 20 bags of chips you can't go back to one and and if you use the addiction understanding what's actually happened in the brain the rewiring the the consolidation of unfortunate connections you're not going back to the one bag of chips anymore and recognizing that that's actually, it's not just that the foods are addictive and you know, they're hard to say no to, but you're changed and uh, uh, there's no going back. And we, yeah, we're not recognizing that. That, that piece is still to be uh, determined in the medical literature. Well, I know you're doing everything to make it uh, uh, the awareness of this as an actual disorder, even though it has a terrible name, food addiction. I think once we talked and we said we should call it dopamine deficiency disorder or something, yes. it sounds <laughs> like because food addiction is not the greatest name, of course. That's right. And so that people these people find food addiction or junk food addict. I mean, there's different things. Um, but it ends up being, you know, I, I, I think that unfortunately food, although it's so nonspecific, is still sometimes the best one because... <coughs> When you've reached that, remember I was talking about this this um, this phenomena that happens, food addiction. If you're at the extreme end of that, you can you can be addicted to healthy foods like carrots, Brussels, Brussels maybe not Brussels sprouts because you're going to get full so quickly. But uh, you can get uh, uh, eating behaviors themselves, you know, binging on healthy foods. So it, it, it expands beyond just the foods, although that it starts initially with the foods. So you're saying it can take four weeks for people to, for their brains to really calm down and get like, it's almost sounds like a detox. The, yes, fact, that, the fact that the people go through such horrible detox to me just shows how addictive sugar flour yes. is. Do you see a similar detox in the people that are detoxing off sugar flour and the ones that are detoxing off of, you know, more, well, I don't know if it's more serious drugs. That's what I've been told that, that it's not as serious as drug and alcohol addiction. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's uh, yes, I do. It's, but it depends on. It, it's like you have to choose your hell. Like if you are coming off of an opiate um, or alcohol, that's a fairly dramatic um, addict uh, withdrawal. Like you can have even a seizure or or um, uh, you know it, you know vomiting, diarrhea, etc. It's very obvious, but it's also fairly quick because the addiction itself. Um, uh, the impact of the addiction is is bigger and stronger and faster. Um, if you do something that is a gradual, slow progression of addiction, like tobacco or like marijuana or like food, um, you don't see the dramatic um, damage until longer, later on. And similarly, the withdrawal is not so dramatic, big, but it's long, it's protracted. So a marijuana withdrawal can take literally weeks and weeks and weeks or you know as opposed to days it like with cocaine or crack it's it's weeks and similarly with uh it's like uh sugar is slow-mo alcohol alcohol might take two or three weeks to withdraw sugar will take two or three months it's longer and uh, I can die of, you know, another way to say it is, is I can die of cirrhosis with alcohol uh, if I'm drinking hard, you know, after maybe seven or 10 years of hard use, it's going to take maybe 17 or 20 years of hard use with sugar, but I'm dying of the same thing. And so similarly with the withdrawal, it's, it's just as awful, but lower grade. On, almost under the radar and people will often um, be experiencing withdrawal think oh I'm I'm depressed and go off and run and get an antidepressant without actually realizing that that's not the cause of their mood disorder that there's a mood disorder per se it's because of the withdrawal that they haven't even seen because it's under the radar right and they probably have been using sugar and flour so long that they don't even yes. recognize what, what are I, I remember when I 
I became a, a sugar sober on J uh, July, Sunday, July 6, 2003. I was actually at an inpatient facility. Well, it wasn't a hospital. It's called the Optimal Health Institute, Optimum okay. Health Institute. And, it, you know, we did green juices, things like that. And I remember detox was a bitch. I remember it, it took a good week of, you know, headaches and crying and abdominal pain and yeah. diarrhea. But when it was over, I was like a new person. I remember coming home and my dogs didn't recognize me. I was so calm. Yeah. And I, I just remember. So what kind of symptoms are, are your inpatients uh, exhibiting? Um, well, the initial uh, is, first of all, cravings. They, and they say, I feel, I'm feeling deprived. And this is often where doctors and uh, people who don't buy into this concept will say, see, you're just depriving the person and that's no good. They're just going to want more than they wanted before. And we just say, yeah, just sit through that. It's just part of the withdrawal. Get over it. It'll, they'll get over it. Anyway, so there's that sense of withdrawal, irritability, obsession. I, how am I going to sleep without my nightly nightcap of Haagen-Dazs ice cream? That's what it was for me. Um, uh, so, so there's anxiety, there's insomnia, there's those kinds of symptoms in the initial uh, week or two. Um, then what happens is, because people like you kind of alluded to this, uh, are using the drug to self-medicate either withdrawal or just other mood moods. If, if you've been using sugar and food to deal with issues, now you've got the issues and the emotion, the raw emotion without the... The, the, the ability to self-medicate. So what happens is, is the, the initial withdrawal is, uh, uh, this is what we saw in our, uh, our um, pilot project when we had like 80 or 90 people. This pattern of behavior where people would get over the major physical stuff in 10 days or so, so that they're actually sleeping better now and not as cranky and not as anxious. But then they had all these emotions and what do they do with their emotions? Um, and become really afraid of them because it's like suddenly they're huge. And, you know, we saw the same pattern with our drug addicts, but the drug addicts had sugar to use. And the sugar addicts no longer even had that. That was like the last defense against raw emotion that you haven't looked at for years because you've been using sugar. So we saw a lot of uh, people um, getting quite overcome at, uh, in, the, in maybe the second and third week or third and fourth week with that. Um, and if I were to build a program now that could be longer than the month we have, it would be on what do we do with the underlying trauma, which might eventually make the person relapse. Wow. You know, I find that with the sugar, people know that sugar is not good. Some use it, some don't. But I find it even hard, harder to get people off the bread, the flour, the pasta, because... Yeah. And that's and that seems to be just as if not more than addictive. Could you talk about why that is? Because people just people know that sugar is addictive. They've read the stuff about yeah. the scans and the MRIs, but you tell them, you know, maybe not for everybody, but for a lot of people, bread, flour, pasta are just it's the same. It's the same, and you know, it, it, it it's the same. And if we were, you know, I would say it, it's. It, it's the same. So we're talking now, instead of just sugar, we're talking now flour. And then ultimately we, we, we could be talking about grains. But l let's just stay with the sugar and flour because I think there's no question that, that, it, it, that those are highly triggering. And I don't know if you can ever desensitize that trigger. But, you know, on the glycemic index, uh, bread and pasta, you know, breaks down into sugar fairly quickly. And the brain, um, and it's not just that it breaks down quickly, but it's also in a huge amount. If you really could just have one piece of bread, you know, every day or two, you could probably get away with that. But, but that's not how we eat in our society. We eat in our society in such a way that it, it's either oatmeal or it's uh, or cereal, let's just call it cereal, or it's bread or toast or pasta all in the same day. So what we're doing is overwhelming um, pseudo sugar, because it is almost sugar, um, into our system. So that what I might have been able to get away with a little bit, I can't because it's basically too much. And these things break down into sugar fairly quickly because they're refined. I think it was you actually that used this word and I keep using it now. Uh, it's been pre-digested for us through the uh, food industry uh, so that it's almost sugar. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. It, it, so why do you think that, because I, I personally eat whole grains, gluten-free grains. I've heard from some food addiction people that whether you eat grains or not, you should 
avoid gluten because the gluten does have some kind of effect, like it turns to gluteomorphine in the brain. Have yes. you heard that? Do you agree with that? Um, yeah. So I, th I think it, yes, I do. So if, if, if you're coming from my perspective, which is let's knock out every trigger food we can, there would be an advantage to doing that. Um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that um, there is a degree of, um, of, of severity with food addiction. And a person can be at an earlier stage or a younger stage where their, their body is more uh, resilient. Um, so that as long as they're not overwhelmed, like you, Chef, you eat grains, but I'm sure that's not all what you're eating all day. You're not eating just grains. It's Correct. a little bit. And I don't eat I don't eat bowls of white rice. I eat grains as part of a meal that may have you know yeah. something else like lots of vegetables and yeah. uh, you know some 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 other maybe like butternut squash that kind of right. thing. Like like why is it that the Mediterranean diet, the classic one, not the one today, which is all pasta, was was considered healthy for the longest time? You know, the pasta was a condiment; it was just part of the larger picture. And I bet that's what you're doing. So my my guess is that if a person is um, at a certain level, uh, even even um, uh, foods like um, a little bit of bread here and there uh, do um, metabolize quickly. If, if it's within a larger context and you're not that damaged, you're probably fine. Now, if a person's at the extreme end where um, I mean, their life is 24-7 food and everything triggers them, it, it would probably be, I mean, I wouldn't say to somebody, you've got to stop dairy, but I might with this person. So th there's, there's a, a, a sort of extreme end. Um, and uh, I, I would say that one of the ways that we can determine that is, so how far is the person in terms of their development of their addiction? Um, and using the glycemic index, um, if they're at the extreme end, I'm going to avoid foods that are sort of um, anything over 50 or 60 on the glycemic index. I'm going to try to avoid and just go with the vegetables and the occasional fruit and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, if the person is not at that extent, they might be able to get away with a bit, not refined, because that's too much. Like you have to, you have to look at uh, the foods and how quickly they break down, how refined they are. I mean, there's a lot of variables. I guess I'm trying to say. Right. Well, you know, my philosophy is that that uh, you know, food addiction seems to be largely self-diagnosed. There are some tests, but it's not like with hypertension. If you go into the doctor, there's a certain number, and you're considered hypertensive. Like you say, mm -hmm. it does exist on a continuum. And yes. my advice to people is, when in doubt, leave it out. And yes. many of the doctors that I've interviewed say that dairy, for many people including that it's, it's calorically dense, is very addictive because just yes. like gluten turns to gluteomorphines, Dr. Exactly. Barnard was saying exactly. how the casein turns to casomorphines. And the yes. last thing we wanted for an addict is to it is be to have more of that. That's right. And so even a little bit of that might be a trigger, whereas for somebody else who's not, who's not really that far along, that little bit may not be that much of a trigger or it might be just okay. And, it, and you know, the other thing is, is that it might be okay at one point in a person's life. And as they get older, like, like I often say, postmenopause, I think something else happens and people have to be tighter. And they say, but this worked for me, but it may not work anymore uh, because there's a, a heightened sensitivity to some foods that there wasn't before. Why do you think, because I agree, most of my work is with women that are older and yeah. either premenopausal, post perimenopausal. Why do you think that things change at that point of a woman's life and it, and it does actually become more difficult with our food choices and sometimes even to lose weight? I, I, it's got to be with the sex hormones, the uh, LDH and the, uh, well, the estrogen and the progesterone. Um, you know, when, when uh, a woman becomes uh, postmenopausal, they... Um, I like to say they uh, are essentially like in, um, um, oh my gosh, am I going to remember it? Um, what do you call it when you're on your period? The week Menarche? Before? No, when you're, the week before, when you're just nasty all the time. Uh, uh, um, um, I'm, I'm, uh, PMS? No, yeah, thank, you, thank you, PMS. I've got to write that down so I remember it. Um, you see, it's been so long since I've had to experience <laughs> So it's kind of like you're in post, it, you're in you're in PMS all the time. So in P, when a person's PMSing, like that's the week before their period and during, um, they want to eat sugar way more than normal. Like they're just hypersensitive. So there's there's um, I, I think people become more um, 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 uh, the, the whole insulin uh, hormonal um, pathways become more sensitive, and it just appears to and, and maybe there's some element of um, weight metabolism slowing down too, thyroid, et cetera, uh, that they just, 
the, uh, the postmenopausal women tend to be more sensitive to the effects of all of this. You know, that's when we get the uh, middle age bulge, which is really just visceral um, adiposity that's happening around the midriff, which is a, a sign of hyperinsulinemia, a high insulin. And that's got to do probably with the inability to uh, tolerate starches that you couldn't tolerate before. So you right. have to cut those out or cut them out more. Right. Or, or find which ones work for you. You know, I find that, that, that it's um, that people really have to know that them, themselves because I find that, you know, that like rice, like you say, for some of the people I work with seems to be a trigger in that it's not yes. that they can't eat it, but they'll exponentially eat because there's something about rice that's intoxicating when it cooks and it smells that, that they can eat yeah. more of it than say like butternut squash, but people have to find, you can't paint everybody with the same brush. They have to find what yes. works for them. I find that chocolate is one of the things that people just really crave that, that are people that are still having their periods. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, I think that we can say uh, you're right. I, and that's actually why I like the work that you do because you recognize the, the inherent um, obst pit pitfalls of, of some of these foods and with that understanding of food addiction, which is what we need so much, especially in the vegan world where um, it's, 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 I don't see it. Now, you're the only person I know who has a really good understanding of that. And there's so many people who are food addicts who want to eat vegan. And I say, I don't know what to do other than read Chef AJ, but you know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Well, thank, thank I appreciate that, and because one of the reasons that I I, I appreciate and admire your work so much is because you really understand the food addiction piece and yeah. can articulate it in a way. Because I, I work with so many wonderful doctors in the plant based movement, and it's not that they don't care about this, but it's it's not where their focus is. Not where their focus is. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and I want to say that um, one of the things like you do understand is that. Uh, uh, you know, not all grades are created equal. And, you know, the whole idea of, I think we can both agree that there are some things that uh, you just can't eat. And I don't think you would advocate it either. And that would be like the refined or, or um, uh, non whole grain grains. Um, Absolutely. Like I find that instant grain. oats are not, I, 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 I tell people, if you're going to eat oats, for example, eat the whole unprocessed oat growth that takes an hour to cook that came in nature. Don't eat the steel cut oat. Don't eat the rolled oat. Don't eat the instant oat. Because it is to me, as a, as a former pastry chef, to me, it's almost like flour. Because yes. I know that because with yes. rolled oats, which is a very common healthy breakfast for some people, oatmeal and fruit, I know that as a pastry chef, that if I were to bake with rolled oats, Mm -hmm. It turns into flour. I, I did this yesterday in a cooking yes. class. So, so yes. but I, I get a lot of flack because I tell people that if you are having cravings, struggling with weight loss or food addictions, right. that a healthy breakfast for other people, which might be rolled oats and sweet fruit, might not be the ideal breakfast for you. That's why I recommend things like beans and greens, vegetables, savory breakfast, because I yeah. find that even with fruit, which I eat, and I think it's delicious, usually putting berries in my salad or maybe yes. apple for dessert. I find yes. that people that are struggling with sugar addiction, it's best to start their day in a savory way and not hit it right away with yes. what I call cake, which to me, rolled oats and fruit is cake. I, I, I would totally agree. And, and, and uh, you know, in my program, which is pretty tight, you know, like, like I said, we, we, we try to open the umbrella up as much as possible. You know, we will allow fruits, but they're very specific fruits. So berries are like number one on the list of good stuff. And we don't allow for cherries. We don't allow for, for bananas because they're so high in fruit. And a person may well be able to eat that stuff, but I would be a little bit nervous about the people who want to then make it as part of some smoothie and all that. Like that's basically making it some kind of version of dessert. And, and it takes what could be a safe thing out into a, a realm that's no longer safe. And that might be fine for the regular person out there in the world, but um, not for somebody who's been badly damaged through previous food, previous diets, other addictions, other addictions. I can't tell you how many alcoholics and, and opiate um, users who are clean in our center who are just snarfing down the uh, the the, the uh, sugar uh, in any any concoction that's possible, including pop. You know, it's it's it's, and they didn't do that before. So there's something that's been damaged or or um, hypersensitized, and so that I don't think they can get away with the grains that are, you know, the rolled or, 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 the, or the cooked stuff with the fruit and all that kind of stuff. I don't think that's... Good. Does it, whatever has been damaged, does it ever get repaired through abstinence? I, by the way, I'm going to be 60 in a few weeks, and uh, on my 60th birthday, and I did not plan this, 
my 60, the day before my 60th birthday, March 21st, is my 3,000th, 3,000th day of abstinence. Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's great. Well, Chef, you look great. And, and uh, I, I, I like to say that I look pretty great, too. I'm 63. And, it's, and I'm going to say it's because that we eat abstinently. I will say you look better than I do. You look very good. <laughs> I eat a lot of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and so do I. So, you know, you're... you're, you're, you're it's, I think that one of the things I love about you is that you show that it's possible to eat vegan well, well. And if only people would, uh, I, we got to get you up there. I don't know. Anyway, I'm sure you're right. Well, so, so, so I really don't have a place in this world because the regular vegans hate me because I'm against the junk food. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't fit in with no. the food addiction people because I don't weigh and measuring. So I'm kind of like, yeah. kind of like out there on my own. You, yeah. know, you, you mentioned the word trigger food a few times, and I use that word as well. How do you, Dr. Tarman, personally define a trigger food? And are these different for different people? Yeah, well, they are different for different people, although there are some universals like sugar and flour. Um, and trigger foods are just any food. And, and the worse in the addiction you are, the more they accumulate. You get more and more. Um, it's basically any food that uh, makes you want more when, you're, when you, you should be done because you're full. You know, the, the whole neurochemistry of eating, which is, I mean, you know, the thing about food addiction is that it is so powerful because our brain was made for food. It wasn't made for cocaine and alcohol. Cocaine and alcohol have just hijacked the food system. And, and, but you know, food is already there and it. And if the food that we're eating is tapping into that, that's why it's so powerful. Um, so you take a food like an apple or, or, um, uh, um, a carrot or something like that, there is a certain amount of fructose, sugar, but there's a lot of fiber and water and everything that makes that food. And similarly with grains, um, the, the whole grains, that the fiber and the, the, the time it takes to digest, these are all mitigators against it becoming something that is overpowering in the brain to make it addictive. And a trigger food is something that's beat the system of um, um, uh, that, that, that the brain tries to normalize or, or sort of make it within a norm that it can handle. So uh, sugar is a trigger because I have a little bit, then I want more. Even though I'm actually full and I don't want more, I still want more and more than I don't. And, and it'll always win out as I want a bit more. And that feeling of wanting a bit more is actually the experience of dopamine itself, which sugar enhances and also the anticipation of sugar enhances it like through hunger or whatever. So um, anything that spurs that dopamine, which initially will be sugar, booze, maybe cigarettes. Um, uh, I think marijuana, that's why I'm not a great fan about the, the, this happening, um, the legalization in this context anyway. Um, and uh, foods that make you want more. Then as the dopamine impairment syndrome, remember we we're talking, this is the, the definition of addiction. Um, grows more foods like flour for sure will trigger that off and then eventually even uh, like I said dairy sweeteners why would sweeteners because it's the anticipation of sweet that the body has and that's kicking off the dopamine do you that's, find that, yeah. that, um, that, 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 that that like you're seeing a lot of people like an end stage food addiction that they're using and abusing these foods and they're not even really experiencing pleasure from them anymore oh. No, no, because dopamine, I mean, people often talk about this in the literature as the experience of um, um, liking something versus wanting it or something like that. You can want something and still not get pleasure from it. This is the common plaintive cry of the addict is, is um, I keep wanting this even though I want to stop. I don't actually like it anymore. Um, and, and that's because the wanting is dopamine. And every time you use something, it's like scratching an itch, you know. The more you scratch, the more itchy it gets. And, you know, it's hurting. You want to stop. But it's still the itch is so big that you just got to keep scratching. And, and it becomes a chasing chasing actually to stop that itch or stop that want, but it never does. The only way to stop that want is to actually um, uh, let it just fizz out, which is hard to do because you're used to chasing and running and doing. And you're actually now being asked to just you know, stop and let it degrade. And that's what we call withdrawal. Lock you up for three months or three weeks rather and let it degrade on its own. Yeah, that, that must be really hard. And you are a medical doctor and you practice addiction medicine and that, yeah. that's got to be hard watching people go through that. 
Yeah, yes. And, and you know, in, in the field of addiction right now, we're, we're ever more focused on um, harm reduction as opposed to abstinence. So the goal here is uh, now more and more, the person is suffering. We don't know if they're going to stay the three weeks. So is there something we can give that will be an alternative that's not as bad? So it might be medication. It might be, um, well, I mean, in the, in the food industry, it's... Um, you know, moderate eating, can we just give them something else that's not as bad, but still sugar in some way. But it, it because we don't like to see the person suffer, but it, it unfortunately it doesn't work because um, you'll never stop craving until it's finally degraded. So if you keep substituting and keeping the, the craving going, you're just prolonging the agony. Right. That, that's true. I found that if you give into the craving, you just intensify the craving and then it's... yes. Yes, and then you never get over it. And then what people have is a bad memory of this, this uh, I, I don't want to quit because that's I'm going to live a life of hell, not realizing that that life of hell is actually only two or three weeks. But if it, it could have been three years if they keep having a little bit all the time and it just keeps that craving monster ongoing or that withdrawal. It prolongs the uh, uh, withdrawal so much that it becomes a, a memory in and of itself that you, you don't want to go there anymore, you know? I'm not going there. This whole dopamine thing to me is so fast. I didn't even know what dopamine was until I went to the True North Health Center and met the authors of The Pleasure Trap who write a lot about this. Uh, but do, do people vary in their sensitivity to dopamine? But I mean, do some people just seem to need more or is it yeah. because of the abuse of these foods that requires yeah. more? You know, I think that the, this is, this is a, you know, one of the, the best questions um, because there's no answer. I, I think that we are definitely... Uh, showing that there's a genetic predisposition. Uh, it's not just to sugar, it's to the, the dopamine. There's a hypersensitivity or, or a flattening so that you need more of something to just feel normal. And, you know, we see that there's, a, it's the dopamine 2 receptors that have received the most research, but there's actually more than just dopamine 2 receptors. Uh, anyway, that have shown that um, alcoholism and obesity and food, there's, a, there's this, this aberration or change or difference in the, in, the, in the dopamine receptors genetically. But we also see that uh, that can change over time, uh, basically over exposure. So if I've been drinking, my, my dopamine 2 receptors may change. If I've been eating, even if I just gain weight, just obesity itself um, will reduce or flatten my dopamine 2 receptors so that I need more food, more booze, more anything to feel better. Uh, so it changes through exposure in the environment. What are we doing to our kids is the, is the question that I ask when we give them cereal and all sorts of crap right from the get-go. I, I fear it's... Um, uh, basically like a gateway to other drugs. Yeah, they say it's something like six, at least in the United States, 67% of people eat, you know, box cereal for breakfast. Yeah. We're not talking about like a whole grain cereal. We're talking about like Cheerios, yeah. you know. Yes, yes, yes. Not not a fan, not a fan. Yeah. Me, Unfortunately, me. that stuff has given grains a bad name. I mean, you know, like, you know, unfortunate. That's, that's just crazy. One thing I find is that, like you say, because food addiction, addiction in general, it's, it exists on a continuum is people need to stop comparing themselves to others. Just because somebody tells you that this food is healthy and, and, and they can eat it and they can eat it in a certain amount doesn't mean yes. that you can. So like what I find, in, and again, this is, I'm not that popular in the plant-based world with my colleagues because I'm, I respect them and I love their work, but I, 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 I'm actually working with people that were like myself, that were obese or, and, and had suffered that like, for instance, we're told that we got to eat nuts that because they're so healthy and to eat at least yes. a day. I know for me, in yeah. some ways, nuts are worse than sugar. Not that I'm going to go seek sugar, but yeah. I would get at this point in my recovery, if there was like a little sugar in a recipe, I would probably be fine. But for me, the fat, I mean, one Brazil nut, all I can think about is eating pounds and pounds of pistachios. And I think that's why it's important for people to not compare themselves to others who may be able to have something. And, uh, and, 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 and that's why I say, when in doubt, leave it out and, and test it yourself. Don't take my word for it. See yeah. if it bothers you. Yeah, although I would, I, because I'm coming from an addiction framework, I would say test it out, but not with yourself. Test it out with somebody else, um, because we have an ability to, it's called stinking thinking, to say, like, I would, you know, with my, uh, I write about it in my book, my book, um, about the, uh, um, I, oh my gosh, the cashews, you know, I, I cashews is fine, like, what, 
what's wrong with cashews? And, you know, especially in the keto thing, you know, you can eat as much as you want. And I did eat as much as I wanted. And I just kept saying, it's not that much. Like one little tablespoon was actually three big heaping ones. And, and uh, I, I could talk myself into the fact that it was healthy and it was fine. If I had done that with somebody else, they would have said, Vera, I don't think so. There's something wrong with this picture when you're willing to uh, you know, run a whole hour just to burn off one tablespoon. Come on, there's something wrong with this picture. Um, and it, it took me actually a year to just go, there's something wrong with this. Uh, so I, 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 in the addiction world, when we're dealing with our triggers, that's why, that's why a sponsor is so important. It's just somebody that, that knows the story, the scene, and how much we can lie to ourselves. And we'll say, are you sure that this is on, you know, you know, you, you, you're, you're having the, uh, it wasn't cashews with you. What was it? It was... Uh, oh, pe about any kind of nut, but peanut yeah, butter. Yeah, yeah. You know, when, when, when the nut is ground into the nut butter, it's even worse. It's to me... No, I, see, see as, a, as a sponsor, I would have said, okay, how come you're so keen on having these nuts all of a sudden? And, and you know, like, like what's, what's with that? You know, it's just somebody that keeps you in check. No, because they're healthy and they have omega-3 fatty. Yeah, so I find that the addicts in general and food addicts in particular have a, have a unique ability to lie to themselves. Yes, they do, but the thing about the sponsors is they know the lies. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, you know, I don't know if this is true because I'm not a doctor or an addiction specialist, but I've heard said that we never technically recover from an addiction. Right. We often just transfer it. So I found yeah. that when I work with people that are generally overweight in general and food addicted, they don't have a long history of of other healthy lifestyle habits, like for example, exercise. And I'm not yeah. shaming or blaming them because I didn't exercise till I was 52. No. But yeah. I find that something for me, and I'm not trying to lose weight. I've been, I've, you know, I lost these 60 pounds and it's been eight years now. But I find that if I don't exercise, I don't feel good in my brain. And it seems yeah. that whatever happens during vigorous daily exercise, yeah. I sit for an hour a day, seems to do something so that I don't have cravings. I don't yeah. have longings. That's right. I mean, it's the same with, uh, you know, dealing with uh, uh, just tr issues or emotions. You know, if we've been, if we've been, if we've had our head in the food, we haven't been exercising, we haven't been dealing with emotions in an appropriate way, and we need to learn how to do all that stuff. And that's actually the work of um, um, recovery is, is now, how do I live and deal with these emotions? How do, what do I do with all this energy? Um, and uh, it, it, how do I enjoy my body in a, in a positive way? Um, I mean, if you haven't been doing all that stuff because your head's been in the food, yes, exactly. That's the work of addiction, actually. Well, where do we set that? Because I'm, I'm assuming that people from the United States probably can't go to your center. Right. Well, but uh, Sorry, there, I want to go back. You said, how do you know, can you ever go back? Um, like, once you're an addict, are you always an addict? Uh, and and I, 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 I like to say that um, I believe that that is the case. Maybe not physiologically, although I think there are physiological changes that have happened. Um, uh, in the same way as a person who is a diabetic, they may be functionally good blood sugar because they're eating well, but it doesn't take much if they go off their food plan that they're, they're back to being a diabetic. Like they bounce back into that um, unhealthy way much more quickly than somebody else. Similarly with addiction, you've got those pathways, they're dormant, but they're ready to flare up at the slightest provocation. Uh, so I, I think that it's I don't think we have we have a phrase in the addiction world, which is once you're a cucumber pickle, you're never a cucumber. And I do believe that that's true. That that once you're there, you you gotta live now life here. Any anything that will bring you back there, you're gonna. It, it's like a fire that's ready to just flare up. Yeah, that's. I just want to say that. So. Uh, you know, the, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that we can't go to your center. If those yes, of us, right. so what is the work of recovery? Is there something in the United? I mean, I recommend people go to the True North Health Center, but they're yeah. not a food addiction place. They're just an right. overall health yeah. place. Yeah. Well, and, okay. So, so in my book, Food Junkies, I actually have some resources in there. And I have on my website, which is um, addictionsunplugged.com, um, resources there. There are actually a couple of centers in the U.S., that deal with food addiction. They, they don't actually specifically deal with food addiction, but the, 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 you can get in there and be treated that way. And there's a couple of outpatient, um, uh, um, like five day things that you can go to that are uh, that deal with food addiction. So look in my book or look on my website. Um, there are uh, um, more and more Facebook groups. I have a Facebook group called um, I'm Sweet Enough uh, Sugar Free for Life. And that's, that's a resource. 
I think it, it, uh, that a lot of people use and it seems to be well. And there's a few others like sugar detox. Th there's a few, like check those out. Um, if, if a person is inclined and they really buy into the addiction paradigm or they have their own previous history of another addiction, the 12 step um, programs have uh, food addiction um, specific, like OA, Overeaters Anonymous, there's something called Gray Sheet Anonymous, there's something called Food Addicts in Recovery Anonymous. And if you go online or even look in my book, um, you can find some actual 12 step. I like them because they're uh, heavy duty on the support. But everything that I've given you are different avenues. It's possible to get help. It's still kind of spotty. You have to search around. My hope is that over time, as more and more people get trained in the field, we now have an official training um, in Iceland. Actually, somebody started something up that's very good. Um, I think that in the next few years, we're going to see more and more, but it's not, not, you still have to hunt around a bit now. Wow. Well, you definitely were in on the ground floor. So thank you for what you do. I just wish some of the plant-based doctors would take more of an interest in this because yeah, we eat we, because we're eating differently, meaning lower on the calorie density scale, like the doc, Dr. Rolls discovered, we're eating very calorie dilute foods, we're not often including animal products, oil and dairy of a high caloric density, we need to eat more food. And mm -hmm. Just, just to have enough calories. And that's why for many of us, a weighing and measuring program can't work because we won't get enough calories. I wish somebody in the plant-based world would have your knowledge and, and be able to help do, some, do what you're doing, but for people that specifically want to recover from food addiction and do it vegan. Uh -huh. Although, can I just say, just to correct you, that I belong to a 12-step program where, where we do weigh and measure. And like my dinner is 24 um, ounces of vegetables. So it's... it's oh, it's, that's enough then, because the, 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 the plan that I get people from, it was seven ounces. And it's like, I, oh, God, I, eat, I, eat, I eat like two pounds. I know. Yeah. I see yours and I think, oh my God, you and I are very similar. Oh, that's but, fantastic. But you have to shop, basically, you have to shop around to find what, what, what you need. But I am along the same lines as you. I mean, I, I don't want to be hungry. I, I'm, a, I'm a volume person. I need to be full. So anyway. Well, you look great. Do, do, may I ask, do you exercise as well? Um, I, I, yes, I do. I do uh, a little bit of weight, uh, weight bear training, like weights, not very much, like an hour, um, uh, not an hour, a half an hour a week. So not much, but I walk every day. Um, I walk every day uh, about equivalent to an hour and I do steps. I go, um, I, I, I live in a house of four floors and I literally book, 20 minutes where I go up and down those steps. Um, and that, believe it or not, was because I started to get knee pain. And um, I knew that with physiotherapy, the idea is um, functionally use the uh, joints or the muscles that hurt until they don't hurt anymore. And that worked. And I just thought, you know, I'm 63. I got I, I want to be able to walk and not have knee surgery. So I do that every day. Well, oh, that that's terrific. You know, I, I don't know if this is true, but you hear these sayings like once a once a pickle, you know, you never go back to being a cucumber. Yeah. I've heard some people say that that alcohol is liquid sugar and yes. that beer is solid bread. So yes. you had mentioned that the people that in the treatment center that were there for maybe drug or alcohol addiction went crazy eating sugar. Yes. Would you say that people that suffer from a food addiction, sugar and flour, should also not drink alcohol? I, I definitely, I definitely think that. I think that people who get try to get away with a little bit of wine here and there, or even smoking pot here and there, I think they're, they're, uh, you know, things. It's not like you, you, you relapse into something and you're immediately back. It's a gradual, slow process. And I think, I think a person, there may be a rare few that can get away with it, but you're really inviting trouble. Uh, uh, booze, booze. Uh, it, it, yes, it is sugar. It's, it's liquid sugar um but it's also uh, opening up the pathway of the brain that is essentially a gatekeeper my ability to say no to sugar um is weakened when i have a glass of wine like why would i do that you know it, it's like I, I always say that addiction is like playing chess against the smarter part of you and i've now just given my queen away like why would I do that? No. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great analogy. I find that, pe that at least the people I've worked with that are, that, uh, are self-acclaimed food addicts, also, uh, they always seem to be addicted to caffeine. They cannot uh -huh. get through the day without caffeine. Yeah. Uh, yes. Well, I, 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 what I've heard more is that some people say they have to stop the caffeine really to get the peace. And uh, I, I have to admit, I'm not a total, I, I, I try to restrain my caffeine use, but I do have it in the morning. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I don't. I, I, but I for some people, that might be a beneficial step. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I really, if a person continues to struggle, we have a phrase in the food community, which is just look to the food, look to the food, look to the food. What are you still doing that is promoting ongoing cravings? Which could be the caffeine, um, it could be the the sweetener that you, it could be the dairy, the the yogurt that you've been thinking was fine. So, yeah. I, I love that. What are you still doing that are promoting ongoing cravings? And I find yeah. with my people, what they're still doing is living in an unclean environment yeah. with family members that are unwilling yeah. to lovingly support them in their recovery by yeah. keeping these junk foods in the house that could completely Absolutely. derail them. Absolutely. I mean, that's the, you see, now we're talking the language of addiction and uh, uh, the tools, recovery tools. And one of the first main recovery tools is people, places, things. You've got to stop the people, throw out the phone numbers, move from the person that's putting it in your face um stop going to the places like the buffets and the movie houses and things get rid of the stuff like the boxes of stuff uh that that's uh in the house you know you you, you, you out of sight out of mind these are all addiction cues and triggers and, and tools until people start believing this is an addiction. Because, yes. you know, as you know, you've been a, yes. a guest every year on the, the Truth About Weight Loss Summit. And while the speakers maybe did not 100% agree about everything, 99% of them agreed about how the environment predicts yourself, when predicts your success when recovering Absolutely. from it. Absolutely, yeah. We, we're social creatures. We yeah. are social creatures. I can be very firmly believing in something, but after three days of being... Uh, in, in an intense environment about, about something that I don't agree with, I will probably start thinking about it. it we're, we're social creatures and we have to buffer ourselves in, in ways because the environment, the social, the, the food environment is so toxic and so relentless. I have to buffer myself to protect myself from that. Yeah, yeah. It, it does, and it makes such a huge difference. People say, oh, you know, you have so much willpower. I don't have willpower. I mean, I may be due, but not more than anyone else. I just happen to live in a clean environment. Yes, and you have, and, and also the work that you do. Like you, you like me, uh, put a lot of effort into creating that buffer. You know, you and I are talking. We're supporting each other's ways of thinking. That's important in, a, in, in, in the context of, you know, what's happening out there. Uh, it's, it's like we're building our own um, our barricades, which I think we need to do. We have to do them with respect, not with uh, uh, in embarrassment and shame. Yeah, and Absolutely. we're social beings. Absolutely. So you know, you know, that, 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 that finally get off sugar. Uh -huh. Walk around with these little dropperful bottles of stevia in oh, yeah. all kinds of different flavors, chocolate and butterscotch, and then they put it in everything. How do you feel about these zero calorie or artificial sweeteners like stevia, erythritol, xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol? Well, they they um, it, um, they do the same thing that um, depending on where you, they promote dopamine and because they promote the anticipation of sweet, so the body's preparing for sweet even if it's not coming into the body. So there's already a dopamine surge happening just on the anticipation itself. So it's it's an invitation to um, um, it, it, it's, a, it's an eroding of the barricade. It may not actually cause, but if you're already on the tipping point because you're eating a little bit of refined grain or something, something else, uh, then it could be just enough. Like when we say look to the food, look to the food, look to the food, that might be the thing that's causing the problem. It, it's not like it'll declare itself like, oh my God, I want more of this now. But, uh, you know, you... you uh, it has a dopamine, it has a connect, you, you have an affection to it, let's call it that. If you can drop the stevia in and walk away without a sense of, oh, I really like that, um, maybe you can get away with it, but somebody, most, most of the time we can't. I, if a person is at the extreme end, I would avoid it completely. How does one know what end of the spectrum they're at? Do you like do an intake or is there a test that we can take? Yeah. No, well, well, there's, there's m multiple, um, I want to say that there's multiple, you know, there's the 20 questions of am I a food addict also in my book. Uh, the, the DSM-5 has a, uh, um, uh, there's been people in the field, like psychologists and doctors in the field of food addiction, who have developed something called the Yale Food Inventory, which is based on the DSM-5, asking questions to determine where are you on the line. But generally speaking, um, I, I, I think that the, the, what, what we're trying to capture are the 
basically the dimensions of do you have a craving that becomes um, an obsession like it takes up a lot of mental real estate in your mind I want this I can't wait for it how will I survive without it like that kind of thinking uh, is it causing a problem in your life because of health or, or social and like you, you avoid things or you hate yourself or you've got diabetes impairment have you tried to control and you can't control have you tried to stop and you can't and if you can put a check mark onto all of those, you're getting closer and closer to the extreme end. And the extreme end will look like somebody who's so obsessed that's all they can think about. Their life is devastated. Like they don't go out anymore. All they do is eat and watch TV or Netflix or whatever. Um, they have uh, severe uh, health issues like um, arthritis, massive obesity, or, or um, uh, what do we call it? Gross obesity, um, diabetes, um, heart, heart disease, and, and they just hate themselves. That's the extreme end. I, I, don't, I think we're all sort of on there somewhere, people who struggle with food. Um, but the more you're like that and it, the more it takes over your life, that's the extreme end. The same way that a crack addict, all they're thinking about at the extreme is where was it, will my next hit be and I don't care where, what my situation is right now if I can get the drug. That's how a food addict thinks. Yeah. Yeah. It just... You know we don't see them because they're, you know, in, in the attics and the basements of our homes or whatever, you know, they don't go out anymore. They order in groceries and, and whatever, just like booze. You mentioned about the obsession. So somebody having gastric bypass, they may lose weight and maybe even reverse their diabetes, but it, it yeah. doesn't do anything to help with the obsession. Well, th that's the whole thing. The, the whole, the whole bariatric community. Um, uh, one of the issues that, affects that community not everybody in that community but um, um, a constant uh, refrain is how do we avoid weight regain and a lot of times people will say well I don't know how to eat but I find that I'm eating and I don't want to eat I'm eating more than I want to and uh, you know we've managed um, here in, in uh, Ontario um, there's a, a couple of groups that have allowed me to kind of infiltrate into their uh, community um, to, to speak to people who have had post-bariatric surgery to say, hey, you know, there could be a food addiction happening. And I think that the surgery itself predisposes a person to a more likelihood of becoming an alcoholic. Um, and similarly, they could become more likely to become a food addict because uh, essentially their ability um, to absorb alcohol and sugar, like liquid sugar pop or, you know, sugar, sugar, flour, um, is much quicker than it was before. So that they're struggling with uh, um, an addiction, but we're not calling it yet that in that community. But I think that that's changing. I think we're starting to hear more about this. I really hope we get it in that community because it must be so devastating. You've gone through the surgery only to see the weight come up again. Yeah. We're starting to see people getting surgery a second and third time. Wow. Never yeah. dealing with the original, you know, the problem. So yeah. Yeah. You know, I've interviewed some doctors and there are, and I'm not, I'm not trying to have an argument about this, but there are some people that don't believe addiction is a disease, even mm. some medical doctors. So, but that's not my question. My question is, is whether you believe it's a disease or it's not a disease, why is there so much shame around it? Uh, yeah, you know, that's a, that's so interesting because we're getting very comfortable talking about mental health stigma in general. Um, but I think addiction, I, I when there's so much addiction rampant, I mean, it, it, it speak to anybody, even the most um, shaming person who says, oh, these people who, who uh, you know, are, are cocaine users and why don't they stop eating? You know, they, they're smoking cigarettes, they're buying stuff. They're, they're, their addiction is showing itself in a different way. Um, that it doesn't really, we're a very ad addiction Ophilic, our society is very much premised on addictive behavior. Well, for God's sakes, there's the whole people joking about, you know, internet binging, binge watching of uh, Netflix and games and, and Twitter and all that. That's addiction there too. I don't know. I don't know. This is, this is a rhetorical question that um, I don't know. I don't want to say it's a conspiracy because, you know, we make a lot of money off of, off of each other's addictions. You know, uh, if I, if I'm in, in business and I'm selling a product that sells itself because it's addictive, I'm making a lot of money. Um, I don't know. <laughs> 
So uh, last question, what's the recidivism rate like and, and is there hope? Yeah, okay, so the recidivism rate is, this is exactly the point that you were making earlier. If you can change the environment around you and buffer the uh, constant persistent um, uh, uh, pressures to eat food that, that you don't want to eat, if you can protect yourself from that, uh, like for example, if you're in a 12-step program where they, you, you, know, you have to go to meetings all the time and you have to call a sponsor every day, call more, like you're basically fitting, fitting in all sorts of things to buffer. If you do that kind of work, whatever that may look like, um, the, the success rate is actually quite high. And I see a lot of obesity doctors saying, um, don't tell people to lose weight because they'll always gain it back and it's just fat shaming and it's so discouraging. And I want to say, you know what, I can give you a handful of 100 people at a drop of a hand um, who have, have maintained their weight loss. And they'll say, yes, yeah, because they had to white knuckle it. No, they didn't white knuckle it. They put their energy into changing their environment, like you and I have done and all of our colleagues have done. So the success rate, we say it in the addiction world, if you, if you work the, do the work, it works. But if you don't do the work, the success rate is pitiful. It's 10% if we're lucky. That's an addiction in general. How many people have, have gone through our uh, program uh, only to come back a, a second and third and fourth time? Probably 80, per, I mean, a lot of people, a lot. And the question is always, what happened? I stopped going to meetings. I stopped calling. I stopped seeing my psychiatrist. I stopped doing whatever it is that was working. So uh, success rate is terrible if you do nothing, um, except just think it's going to work on willpower. But if you do all the stuff, the tools, and build that environment, get rid of that guy that wants you to eat the crap or drink or whatever it is, um, just, uh, everything that you do in that, it, your success rate is getting better. That's amazing. Really? Work on recovery and change your environment. This has just been so wonderful. Thank I learned you. so much from you, and I appreciate your work so much. Thank you, Chef AJ. I love speaking with you. Thank you guys so much for watching Healthy Living. I'm Chef AJ, and I make healthy taste delicious.